Hello, welcome to the Real Estate Regroup Show. I am your host, LJ Walker, a real estate investor presenting information that will shift your thinking on how you can own a home or invest in one. Since April is Abuse Awareness Month, I decided to dedicate today's program to investors and homeowners who wish to aid those who are being abused through real estate and also provide housing options to those who are trying to escape their abusers. Let's face it, abuse does not discriminate men, women, children, rich, poor, and people of all nationalities and cultures unfortunately have abuse amongst them. When many try to escape, they often end up homeless. Supportive housing is an economical and profitable solution to the problem. Unfortunately, there is a shortage of supportive housing properties nationwide. Although money from the federal government has recently been cut for housing, there is still a lot of grants available via HUD to churches and nonprofit organizations. You'll also find more money is available from your local governments. Some senators give out free grants to purchase and run these programs. And also, um, for those of you who are in the New York City area, many of you may be aware that the mayor is championing and making money available for those who wish to convert all or a part of their home into supportive housing. Some places, of course, um, will it'll be a little bit easier for one to make that conversion than others and they he's also making it easier for those who wish to purchase or develop properties specifically aimed at uh, supportive housing what i have noticed lately especially in manhattan since everything is so expensive here is that churches, nonprofits, and developers on a few projects have teamed up to either develop new properties or buy properties to convert into supportive housing. As an individual, you can also make a contribution as well. If you already have a home and let's say you are having a hard time selling your home you may be able to sell it to hpd or hud you can also rent it out to one of the agencies that assist abused women and children with housing many of the agencies would act as the property manager so you wouldn't really have to worry about taking care of the tenants and their needs it might be beyond your capacity if you are not a social worker yourself or did not take psychology in school anyway your tenant would actually be the agency now as some of you know there are different types of supportive housing there is senior housing, for example, that many of you have heard of. Uh, housing specifically geared towards abused individuals, however, might be a little bit easier to manage or convert because with senior housing, you normally have to widen the doorways, lower the electric light switches and things of that nature. But with, and, and that's because seniors many of them become handicapped as they get older however when it comes to uh, victims of abuse normally they aren't handicapped so you may not necessarily have to make those adjustments in your home in addition uh, just to point out to everyone 
all who partake in supportive housing, whether it's for abused, senior citizens, veterans, etc., qual do qualify for a low income tax credit. What you would have to do, of course, is check your check the state's insurance requirements. I would also consult a lawyer and an accountant because the requirements for setting up supportive housing differs from city to city. For example, I was looking at some videos when I was doing my research and many advise that people get something called a CO3. However, in New York, you need to get, if it's a, uh, for runaways, for example, runaways and throwaways, you would have to get something called R-H-Y or T-I-L-P. Just to backtrack, the reason why I'm including runaways and throwaways under the abuse category is because a lot of people who run away, run away because they are being sexually assaulted within the family um, or uh, neighbors or friends close by and they see that running away is their only option then you have the throwaways now the throwaways are a little bit different throwaways are, are children whose parents have thrown them out of the home and it's normally due because the parents are not able to accept their sexuality or sometimes the child may have gotten pregnant or sometimes the child does not get along with the parents new boyfriend or girlfriend so they get kicked out of the house in a way that's somewhat um, like neglect so I'm putting those two that's why I include them in the abuse category Anyway, getting back to today's program, getting back on track. Um, the other thing that you may want to do when you decide to do supportive housing is you may want to consult with an architect or just go directly to the Department of Buildings and find out if there are any uh, changes or alterations that you may want to make. Um, for example, um, and I'll bring this up again. I know of a person who worked for a lady who had a four family home. She actually remodeled her home. It was two bedrooms on each floor, but she made the dining room into a bedroom. And she also converted part of the living room into a bedroom to hold more people into the house. She was actually getting paid per bed as opposed to per room. All right, next, just so that you know, in New York, if you wanna make a building supportive, only 60% of the building has to comply to be supportive housing. You don't have to make the entire building comply to being supportive and in many cases both the tenant and the agency pays you the rent especially if it's congregate congregate is when there's a mixture of um, people who are in the supportive program and people who are not but then you also have some programs some agencies where they pay you the full rent a lot of times the social worker does not live inside of the building, but they do visit. Sometimes they have an office downstairs and they also uh, work different shifts. Uh, the same person that I mentioned before uh, with the worked with the lady with the four family building um, did work in shifts. Another thing um, to note that many of the apartments, as mentioned before, a lot of times the rooms are shared. So it'll be, especially if let's say it's um, for all women or if it's for all teenagers, 
normally they put three or four people in the same room. Uh, when they do that, of course, they're the same sex. If it's the teenagers, by the way. And that's how you're paid per bed as opposed to being paid per room. However, let's say the um, people that you choose are going to be women of domestic violence. A lot of times the whole, a lot of times she's not by herself. A lot of times she has kids. So she and the kids will stay in that one room as opposed to sharing it with someone else. A lot of times the only time they share is if they are a single woman. And I've seen this when I used to work down at Volunteers of America. The other thing to note is that many times they don't allow visitors at all. Or if they do, they only allow visitors at a certain time. When it comes to uh, women of domestic violence, a lot of times they won't let anybody of the opposite sex come to visit them at all unless it's their son or another social worker. So the, because they are so strict, you normally don't have to run into, worry about running into having any problems with them. And if there are any problems, again, the agency is the one that deals with them and not you. Um, in many cases, especially when it's temporary, they are looking for apartments that are going to be furnished. So in that case, if you're going to be doing temporary apartments, I would recommend that the furniture just be sturdy, not uh, brand spanking new because it's going to wear down through wear and tear. So keep, just keep that in mind. The next thing I want to address is the not in my backyard myth. There has always been this saying by many people that if you allow certain people in your neighborhood, it's going to bring down the neighborhood. Well, in the case of supportive housing, that actually has not been the case. In fact, many homes that are near supportive housing the price of the homes, the values actually increase as opposed to decreasing. And I do find this to be true because the other day when I was in Brooklyn, I could see where in D the Ditmas Park area, beautiful, well-kept. I was shocked to find that many of the homes were only between one and two million dollars, according to the realtor that was taking me around. I did not see any supportive housing in that area. However, downtown Brooklyn, I know they do have supportive housing down there and the homes are much more expensive. Many of them don't provide parking and the yard space is sometimes very small or non-existent. So there might be something to the study that was presented by NYU and the New York Times. The next thing that I wanted to point out to you is this. By having supportive housing, as mentioned before, it decreases homelessness. And many times when people are running away or have been thrown away, they end up homeless. And being on the streets for a long time, eventually you can get hurt and you'll need hospitalization. Well, to keep a person, a homeless person in the hospital is $2,000 a day in New York. The other thing that could happen when people become homeless is crime increases. Well, I want to tell you this. The lady that owned a four family home that was converted into supportive housing, she made $480,000 a year. 
she had 40 beds in that particular house. You may say that's a lot, but wait. To jail one person in New York City for one year is $6 million. For, 40, for in a 40 bed uh, unit. Shelters, which is sometimes worse, it costs $1 billion to build and it costs $1.6 million per person to keep it running. So you see supportive housing is definitely more economical in the long run. However, since there is still that stigma amongst many people, I would not go around telling all of my neighbors and everybody that, you know, I was going to change my home to supportive housing. Now, my neighborhood is a little different because one of my neighbors, she's already done it. We've been here 20 years together and there hasn't been a problem. She doesn't do abuse victims. She actually does another population, um, those who are mentally disabled. However, because the lie goes around faster than the truth does, um, what I would do in case it did get out is I would just contact the local clergy and hopefully they can give you some support um, in case any neighbors start picketing or um, causing you any grief or strife. So... Next, moving right along, I want to focus more on helping those who are runaways. If you are a runaway or a throwaway, please go to https colon backslash backslash shnny.org and then do a search looking for supportive housing in New York City. And hopefully that will help you find a good match as far as where you can go and get help. Um, as mentioned before, um, many of the runaways um, are running away due to sexual assault. Sometimes there are other reasons as well, but that is, I would say, um, one of the biggest reasons. Another place where uh, the youth can go is the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. Another place that I've mentioned in the past, a place that I went to for an after-school work program is the door, the center of alternatives. They actually have their own building where they house teenagers um, up to 25 years old. I know that's past being a teenager, but there have been those that have moved out before the age of 25. What they do is they help you uh, with your education. They give you skills, they give you a job, free food, free clothing. They also teach you life skills such as cooking. And there's also extracurricular activities such as karate that you can learn there. So please, if you find yourself in a desperate situation, know that these organizations can definitely help you. Um, the next place I'm going to mention is the Department of Youth and Community Development. Uh, you can go there, and I believe they have a conglomerate of different services to aid you if you find yourself homeless and on the street. Now, if you see someone, if you are not a runaway or throwaway, but you see a child being abused, you can contact the National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-4-A-CHILD, the number 4-A-CHILD. If you suspect human trafficking, you can contact the National Human Trafficking Resource Center at 
7888. Or you can also go to the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. Landlords, if you wish to get the proper certification to allow runaways to stay in your multifamily home, I, I would suggest it be a multifamily home, then you can go to http colon backslash backslash www.nyc.gov and search for Runaway Homeless Youth, R-H-Y. Now, from what I gather, you really only need the certificate if you plan on being the social worker or the assistant to the teenagers or that you're um, planning on helping. I'm not sh too sure about this, but I don't think you need it if you are going to let an agency come into your building. And I say this because my neighbor, she does not have any kind of license or any kind of certificate. All she did was put an ad in the newspaper, in New York Times, to be quite honest with you. The agency contacted her and asked her if they could rent the space from her. She signed whatever documents and that was it. So from my knowledge, she never mentioned to me anything about getting a certificate. I don't believe she has one. My relative now, my relative is a social worker. She has supportive housing in another state and she has, a, has her certificate. So that I believe is the difference. If you are actually going to be hands on with the people of that of a particular population who have been abused, I believe you do have to get that certificate. But if you're not, then you basically go to the agency. Next, I want to address those who uh, fall in under uh, domestic violence. Again, for New Yorkers, if you are in NYCHA, NYCHA has an emergency transfer program. So if you are being abused by uh, the person that you are living with in NYCHA, you can, be, you can ask to be transferred. I believe also if the person does not live in NYCHA, but they know where you live and they're stalking you, you can also ask to be transferred as well. You may also want to contact the Office of Supportive and Affordable Housing Services. Other agencies to contact is Safe Horizon, New Destiny, National Network to End Domestic Violence, the Safe Housing Partnerships, United Way, Women in Need, who I am quite familiar with, know people who actually work there or volunteered there in the past, Volunteers of America, because I myself volunteered there in the past. These places have their own domestic violence, supportive housing. If you need additional assistance if you wish to uh, call for not just housing assistance but uh, just to speak to someone there is the national domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-7233 there's the national dating abuse helpline at 1-866-331-9474 there's also the Americans Overseas Domestic Violence Crisis Center at 1-866-US-WOMEN, 879-6636. So 
I would definitely uh, call those people. It's not only that, but if you are someone who knows someone who is being abused, you may also want to contact those people. Now, um, as mentioned before, men have also been abused. And there's not that many, but there are a few supportive housing for men and some now that used to be all women now also accept men who have been abused in a domestic violence situation. I will warn you though, when it comes to pets, many are not that open. It's only 3% of supportive housing in the country that allow pets. So you may have to uh, give your pet to the ASPCA in case um, the program that you find does not provide the housing that you need to accommodate your whole family, meaning your children and your pets. So that's pretty much what I wanted to tell those of you who are in need or who know someone who may be in need. Next, flipping the script a little bit, I want to address landlords who may find themselves in a situation where one of the people or one of your tenants is abusive to the co-tenant. If you suspect that there is abuse on your property, because this is a litigious society, you might be held liable. You may want to call a lawyer just to be on the safe side. But if you, if you see a child being abused, it would behoove you to please call Child Protective Services it's better safe than sorry. Another thing, uh, or if it's a woman, an adult or man, then you may want to call the domestic violence hotline numbers that I've mentioned above. Next, please note, a tenant has the right to terminate a lease due to a domestic violence situation as long as they give you a copy of the restraining order and they also put in writing that they are leaving your property. If someone is actively violent on the property, you and any other tenant have every right to call, call the police yourself and to file a, a restraining order against that person yourself. All of you should get an order of protection against that particular person. Here's where laws differ. In New York, if one of the tenants is the abuser and has shared the lease, the abuser can be removed without a right to cure. Meaning you can go, sh after you get that, uh, restraining order, you can go straight to eviction court and have that person removed. Other states, you have to give them a three-day notice in order to leave. So again, I've always said this and I'll keep saying it again. Each state and city is different. Now, Know this, and this is pretty much everywhere. If the victim who is still living on your property, after a restraining order has been given, allows the abuser back on your property, you have the right to evict that victim as well. And we all know, unfortunately, 
sometimes that happens where they go back to the person who has hit them. And the reason why you have that right is because in most states, there's something called the tenant's right to quiet, double underline the word quiet, enjoyment. All that screaming, yelling, um, property damage probably um, would occur and many times do occur in these situations. So yes, even if they pay their rent on time, because they violate that other, because they violate those two orders, you have the right to evict them. And it's probably best for your safety as well. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is this. Let's say a tenant or a prospective tenant approaches you for an apartment and they are qualified for that apartment. In New York, if you live in a two family, you do not have to let that woman or that man who is being abused onto your property. You can decline. However, if the, the building is more than a two family and you don't live in there, then they have, they have to be treated like everyone else. So keep that in mind. And if they're not treated like any everyone else, then you could be sent up for discrimination. So word to the wise, just be very, very careful in handling these situations. And for those of you who are wondering, well, why would, would a landlord refuse? If a landlord lives in the building and they have their family there with their children, there is this fear that when the person, the abuser looks for them, they, they normally find them. And then that puts their family at risk too. So I understand why people are afraid, but um, just... You just got to be so careful nowadays. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy out here. Okay. Well, folks, I know that was a long one. I hope that the information that I shared will inspire you to reboot your mind, reset your focus, and make smart financial moves. Feel free to pass it along. Remember, each one, reach one, teach one. Bye for now. Until next time, have a good night.